Thank you so much for having me. As um, alluded, I'm a slightly unusual uh, addition to this, this panel and this event, so thank you so much for having me. I am not from academia or the public sector. In fact, you couldn't get more private sector than me. Um, actually, the, the role you attributed to me is my previous role. Now, I used to work at the Monetary Authority, which is the central bank of Hong Kong and the bank regulator. But I've now returned to private practice. I'm a financial services regulatory lawyer, so I've been very, very busy over the last 10 years. Um, and I'm a partner at Norton Rose Fulbright, which is one of the biggest global law firms. I represent basically banks and major players in the financial services industry. This is a conference about blue sky thinking and issues affecting the world today. I, I must confess that I'm, due to the nature of my job, I'm not prone to introspection. I'm a bit more like the banana lady you mentioned this morning. You know, I'm at the in the trenches, not in the ivory tower, at the coal face, getting shit done. However, what I can bring to the table is an understanding of what happens, particularly in the financial services industry today, what's happening on the ground, and specifically what we're seeing in Asia. A second confession I have to make is that I envisage this talk about, to be about regulation, regulating global finance, and the trends we are seeing. But on reflection, what this talk is really about is about data and technology. And this is probably as it should be. We're moving into a world where data is king, and banks and payment providers are, talk, are calling themselves technology companies for, first and foremost. The new banks of today are on our smartphones. We exchange information, services, and money, peer-to-peer, person-to-person, person-to-business, and business-to-business, -business, and we do so instantly. If you go to China, you can't actually pay with cash anymore. You can only pay on your smartphone, with Alipay and WeChat. So this is coming and this is coming to stay. I'll begin the presentation by talking about these new types of digital assets called cryptocurrencies and a new method of capital raising called initial coin offerings and then put them into context. I'll talk a bit about the industry trends we're seeing, the regulation of these new trends and finish off by discussing the role of central banks and the state in all of this. And this is where it does tie into what we've been talking about today. And the last point, and this is more of a philosophical discussion then, is the discussion on how these new digital assets are changing the way we view the state and central banks in acting as trusted intermediaries in the payments process. But let's first look at what the press are saying about cryptocurrencies, and I suspect that's what most of you in this room are thinking as well. Particularly 2017 and the early part of 2018 was the year of the token fundraising events. There's been a great deal of enthusiasm shown by investors or people providing the funds for these events, but there's been many words of caution as well. The most famous is probably the statement by Jamie Dimon, who's the chairman of JP Morgan, who basically said that Bitcoin is a big fraud and is only suitable for money launderers. Regulators have also expressed words of caution, both the SEC in the US, the UK's FCA. You probably all know what this is. Bitcoin is probably the most well-known cryptocurrency. In reality, I should be on a beach somewhere in Bermuda. I was approached in 2013 by the first Bitcoin exchange that came to Hong Kong, asked me to advise them on their regulatory position I thought, what is this? This is rubbish. This is never going to take off. This was when Bitcoin was about 20 US dollars. At some point, it was over 12,000 US dollars. I did not invest. I could be on a beach. I'm still very bitter about this. There have been cryptocurrencies and artificial currencies before Bitcoin, and there have been many since. There are probably thousands now in circulation. They were actually developed in 2008, 2009, we don't, still don't know who developed it. The person or persons did so under a pseudonym called Satoshi Nakamoto, but we don't know who is behind that name. What's interesting is that the technology behind Bitcoin, which is called blockchain, is not new. The, the, what's new about it is the combination of the existing technologies. One aspect of it, and I'm not a technical expert, is that it involves cryptography 
but it also involves what's called consensus protocols, having transactions of a currency witnessed by a community in a way that enables that no one person or group of persons is in charge. That's where the word decentralized comes from. The result of this blockchain technology is that the transaction records are effectively immutable, and this is a game changer. They can't be altered and they can't be repudiated. In addition, the blockchain technology and the way it was put together for Bitcoin ensures there's no possibility of double spending of currency. Let me show you a short video to explain, courtesy of the BBC, which, alluding to this morning's discussion, is very good at bringing science to the masses. When you want to buy something normally, using your normal bank card, this is what happens. I give my card details to the shop. The shop asks the bank if I'm good for the money. The bank checks its records to see if I've got enough in my account. If I do, it lets the shop know. It updates its records to show the movement of money from my account to the shop's and it takes a little cut for its trouble. Now, if you wanted to remove the bank from that system, who else would you trust to keep those records and not alter them or, or cheat in any way? Well, I wouldn't trust you. I wouldn't trust you. In fact, I wouldn't trust any single person. But I might trust everyone. The idea is you don't have a central record of transactions. Instead, you distribute many, many copies of this ledger around the world. Each owner of each copy records every transaction. So, to buy something using cryptocurrency, I give the shop my details. The shop asks all the bookkeepers if I'm good for the money. The bookkeepers all check their records to see if I have enough. If I do, they tell the shop and then all update their records to show the movement of money. So there's no way that a forged transaction can make it in. If I try to alter a ledger, it won't match all of the other copies. And it gets rejected. Oh, and one of them, at random, will be given a reward of some newly created cryptocurrency. This is how cryptocurrencies work. And remember, all of these bookkeepers, all of these ledgers, they're not actually people. They're computers. Lots of computers. Actually, in one point I should also make is that people in the press, you hear about cryptocurrencies, but actually the blockchain technology has other potential applications, and this, this is going to really change the world. I mean, when I, start, I started at Norton Rose a year ago, and now 30, over 30% 30 of my practice is just in this world from a standing start of 12 months ago. We're seeing this uh, application in shipping, in trade finance, in the administration of insurance claims, in the authentication of diamonds, the possibilities are endless. There are, as I said, many cryptocurrencies, and in this slide, we, 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 unfortunately, you probably can't see at the back, but this is basically the list of earlier this week um, of the top 10 cryptocurrencies listed in descending order of market capitalization. Um, you can see Bitcoin with about 90, $94 billion worth of value as of earlier this week um, from a high I mentioned of over $12,000 per Bitcoin. It has now dropped to under $5,000. So you can see there's tremendous volatility in the market and that's where some of the more philosophical questions around, well, how do we rein this in? How do we stop market manipulation? How do we regulate this thing that's really decentralized and not capable of regulation? How do we rein it in? So the second on the list is Ripple, which was designed as a blockchain platform specifically for interbank transfers between financial institutions. 
And the third one most people will have heard about is the Ethereum blockchain. Ethereum is not just a digital currency, although Ethereum uses an internal uh, currency called Ether. Ethereum is actually a decentralized software platform that enables so-called smart contracts and distributed applications to be built and run. And actually, a lot of the other cryptocurrencies and other tokens are built on the Ethereum blockchain. Which brings me nicely on to the, the sort of second pillar of the presentation, which is initial coin offerings, or ICOs, as they're sometimes called. 2017 and the first half of this year was really the, the year or the 18 months of ICOs. These are basically projects involving the creation of cryptocurrencies or tokens, and the promoters of these projects raise money for their project by pre-selling these tokens. And then we come to really interesting discussions of well, isn't this actually just a capital raising and should this not be regulated like any other securities offerings? Why are these people in a sort of unregulated vacuum where no one can really see what they're doing? And the uh, possibilities for man manipulating the market are really endless. What is an ICO? An analogy um, would be if, if I was going to start an airline, airline that, let's say, would fly initially between Singapore and Hong Kong, and the way I'd like to fund this airline is I go to you and I say, would you like to buy in advance some frequent flyer miles for my airline? Now, you might have a good legitimate business reason for buying frequent flyer miles in advance. The legitimate, legitimate business reason in this case would be you have a business that has branches in Singapore and Hong Kong, and you need your staff to fly between the two destinations frequently and you think you might be able to save some money by buying these frequent flyer miles in advance before you even need them. There's obviously a number of risks in doing that. The airline doesn't get off the ground. Frequent flyer miles might change in value. The business needs might change by the time that the airline actually comes along. But the basic idea is that you're buying something in advance that you can use later for some kind of business purpose. The terminology that's come to be used is what's called a utility token. It is a token that has some utility value for somebody in some particular application. There are a lot of people investing in these ICOs, and I would guess that nearly all of them are not doing it because of some utility. They're buying it as an investment because they think the value will rise and that there'll be a market in these and the price will go up, i.e. it's all for speculation. But actually, that's true for initial public offers of securities as well and other sorts of investments. So this slide is something that's taken from a site called CoinStaker. It gives a sort of di a diagrammatic picture of what really goes on. So we have two investors, A and B, down there. I like the gender balance representation. <laughs> Um, the big jar at the top with the yellow um, contains the tokens or the currency that's going to be created in this particular coin offering. The idea is that investor A, you see the black arrow, um, from investor A to the wallet address, investor A is pre-purchasing some tokens. Likewise, there's a black arrow for investor B to the wallet address who's doing the same. Typically, these ICOs, the investment is made in Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. So investor A and B make pre-purchases by putting Bitcoin into a wallet address, which is then transferred to the owner of the jar, the issuer. When the tokens are actually created, which may not be for some time, so you're pre-buying it, some of the tokens, the ones in the bottom half of the jar, will be distri distributed to investor A and B. Uh, the green arrows going down from the jar show this distribution. In this particular case, if not all of the tokens are funded, the ones at the top of the jar, the ones surrounded by red, would be destroyed. This slide shows the top 10 initial coin offerings um, in 2018 so far. So I'll just talk about a couple of these. EOS is actually relates, this is a funding to develop another type of blockchain to compete with Ethereum. Telegram was a fundraising to develop a new type of instant messenger service. Then an interesting one further down, Tata2, is a, de a decentralized system that rewards users for putting, for viewing and putting social content onto a platform, streaming films, etc. This chart 
shows a histogram, the blue vertical bars of the amount raised in US dollars per month each month in 2018. You can see the explosion of ICOs towards the summer and then it dipped down from the autumn onwards. We can really speculate as to the reasons why. My personal view is that because of the increasing regulatory scrutiny and the dropping of the value of the main cryptocurrencies this year. What are we seeing in sort of industry trends? Um, as I said, we work a lot in this space. And what we're really seeing is that these types of digital assets are becoming more mainstream. And they're not really, essentially this was a retail phenomenon initially, but now we have uh, institutional investors really moving into this space. We get a lot of hedge fund asset managers calling up wanting to invest in this new asset class, and, and the regulators are now starting to pay a lot of attention. Um, there's a tremendous amount of cryptocurrency exchanges being, being formed. Um, the first Bitcoin-related businesses are actually being listed in traditional stock exchanges for the first time. So in Hong Kong, we're working on the, the listing of a business um, that in mainland China, interestingly, um, which involves machines that are used for mining of Bitcoin. Um, the sophistication of the product is increasing. Initially, people were throwing money at all sorts of stuff, and it really was like a replay of sort of the uh, dot-com era of 1999. There was, a, as you saw in the first slide, it was sort of throwing money at nothing, no value, no balance sheet. That's changing slowly. Um, there's also, interestingly, a lot of competition between countries. Everyone wants to be the next crypto valley, but they want to do so uh, in a way that doesn't endanger the investing public. So Singapore is doing particularly well in this space. Last week I was in Singapore at the FinTech Festival. There were 40,000 people there. Christine Lagarde was there. She gave a very interesting talk about what the IMF is doing in this space. So this is something that's not going away. But interestingly, it's been some of the smaller offshore countries which have realized that the traditional banking services industry is dying due to increasing AML, anti-money laundering rules. Some of their offerings are not so um, uh, sought after anymore. So it's the Maltas, the Gibraltars, the Baltic states, who have been at the forefront of developing legislation to allow for regulation of this new type of technology. What are the regulators doing? This is very interesting, and it ties into what was said this morning about policymakers and how do you explain to policymakers what is going on. In this sphere, the regulators are chasing the market. The market is changing every month and the regulators are struggling to keep up. I should know, I was at the Monetary Authority at the time when sort of Bitcoin first came around, and people were, what is this? We don't know what this is. Let someone else deal with it. Um, interestingly, it's the ones that have a central banking function as well as a regulatory functions that are struggling the most because they feel threatened um, by, by the rise of something that could re replace fiat currencies. Um, so partly what's been happening is the regulators are trying to upskill themselves as well and to work out really what's going on and how to deal with this. Um, the big focus so far has been to actually see what these tokens and what these cryptocurrencies should be classified as. Is it a commodity? Is it a currency? The tokens, are they securities? Should they be regulated like securities? In most countries, securities issuances are highly regulated. And these, these utility tokens are really skirting the, the regulatory net completely. Um, a big focus has been on uh, the effects of, of Bitcoin on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. So a lot of the jurisdictions have really attacked it from, from this angle and have made um, all the cryptocurrency exchanges, but also all the banks dealing with everything to do crypto uh, have to pass heightened AML and CTF checks. As I said, there have been some facilitative jurisdictions as well who've developed regulatory and legislative frameworks to deal with this. And um, we're starting to do a lot of work in this space. So we're advising the government of the Philippines to work on a new framework for their distributed ledger technology uh, legislation, essentially. So it's, it's a really interesting time to be in this space. 
And this is the, the interesting kind of philosophical question that ties in with what, what, what role does the state play now where you have this whole new uh, digital currency. As I said at the beginning, money is changing. The way we, we treat and handle money is changing. There's a huge amount of pressure on traditional deposit taking commercial banks. And, you know, what are we doing when the central bank is no longer the trusted middleman and the, the, the trusted intermediary in this space? As I said last week, Christine Lagarde was in Singapore, and um, it's very interesting the IMF is working uh, on this as well and looking into whether states should be issuing digital currencies themselves. A lot of jurisdictions are looking into this quite seriously. Um, partly why they're promoting this is because it will really increase financial inclusion. If you think about the farmer in Kenya, he may not have access to a bank branch to draw money, but he sure as hell will have a smartphone, and that's the future. So actually, a lot of regulators and, and, and um, supra-regulators like the IMF are actually quite into the idea of creating some type of state-sponsored digital currency because it will enable people, the unbanked to be banked. Um, another aspect is that they think, the IMF thinks that um, you know, they can somehow guarantee a certain amount of security and consumer protection and particularly privacy in this space. Um, a good example is, you know, really people are looking into credit ratings and algorithms are working out whether you're good credit or bad credit. And AI is having a huge role in this process. I mean, we do a lot of work in the robo-advisory space as well. So wealth managers and are creating investment portfolios with, for people. Not, you're not, you don't go and see your bank branch manager anymore. It's a computer who decides what you should be investing in. And um, it looks at your spending habits. So apparently the people who buy frozen pizzas and beer should have a lower credit rating than the people who are buying the organic broccoli. So you know there is a role there for the state to play in making sure that people are not given adverse credit ratings because of certain spending habits and that your personal data is not constantly being disclosed to the commercial sector. And the only last point I wanted to make on this is that um, Interestingly, the jury is still really out on what effect all these digital currencies and these token issuances will have on financial stability. So the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, which is sort of the G20 organization that, that looks at this in the summer, said, well, we don't think it has uh, an impact on financial stability just yet, but they are looking at uh, creating a sort of a risk management framework to deal with this. Interestingly, also, um, the Hong Kong government looked at the summer as to their anti-money laundering legislation because they had the FATF in Hong Kong to do the evaluation of their regime. And right, there was a 200 page uh, sort of note that they wrote and right on the last page was all about cryptocurrencies and how they thought that there was a very low risk related to cryptocurrencies, which I thought was um, extremely surprising. So I guess the message here is that this is here this is staying, and we need to think about the role that we're all going to play in this new economy and new digital economy. And I would, this also fits in with this morning, there are lots of Douglas Adam quotes. Um, I, I found this particularly hilarious, and you can decide for yourself where you're, where you're based age-wise <laughs> in this. And um, I, I guess uh, it, it isn't against the natural order of things, we all have to get used to it. Thank you so much.